there is meant to be body diversity on this planet of ours, and that we're not all meant to conform to what happens to be right now a very narrow, uh, idealized aesthetic. You're listening to the Small Business Mastermind, a podcast created to help small businesses juggle business, finance, health, and wellness. I'm your host, Morgan Berna. To subscribe to the podcast, visit olympiabenefits.com slash podcast. The Small Business Mastermind is brought to you by Olympia Benefits. To learn how you can save on your health and dental costs, visit olympiabenefits.com. Okay, okay, I know fitness is probably the last thing you want to be thinking about right now, but I promise this is not your typical fitness episode. What if instead of going into the holiday season and seeing it as a time where your fitness falls apart and the new year as the time where you have to restart from scratch all over again, you looked at fitness as a variable that ebbs and flows with every season? What if instead of counting calories and tracking miles run, you made the goal of being able to carry up your groceries alone or bend down and pick up your child without any pain? It's a different way of looking at fitness, and our guest today explains why it's more sustainable in the long run. On this episode, Jillian Gertzen explains her body-positive approach to fitness and why using what she calls health zones is a better way to improve your mood and productivity while stabilizing your fitness year-round. We talk enjoying the holidays without fitness or diet guilt, especially this year when things are already so stressful, and how to handle gym closures or not enjoying working out at the gym altogether. We talk realistic fitness goals and how this all ties into how we perform at work. I promise this episode will leave you feeling excited and energized instead of worrying about those dreaded New Year's resolutions. So with that, let's jump right into the interview and I'll be talking to you again at the end of the episode. Welcome, Jillian. I'm so excited to have you here with us today on our second last episode for the year. I cannot believe we're almost at the end of 2020. So thank you so much. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Jillian is an author, a dynamic speaker, an engaging coach, and a powerful body positive fitness advocate. She has a strong and engaging voice and a powerful presence with an education backed philosophy that is relatable and realistic. She has been featured on blogs, interviewed for numerous podcasts, and used as a source for many publications. Her book, The Elephant in the Gym, is a response to the fitness and diet industries that have really done a number on us. It sounds the alarm and shines a light on what isn't working so we can gain clarity and firm footing on this previously rocky road. Very lucky to have Jillian with us here today. Fantastic. So today we're going to be talking all about fitness, but from the perspective of you know, having a bit of grace with yourself and how to stay fit while also, you know, having enjoyment with it, having some self-love with it and all that sort of thing. So I wanted to first start out with your journey with fitness. Mm -hmm. What got you interested? Was this a lifelong thing? Uh, Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I think, you know, more than this assumption is often that I've been fit my whole life. And that's actually not not my case at all. Um, I actually was kind of the chubby kid that hated PE and really didn't like moving her body. And it wasn't until I was about 19 that I I met some colleagues in a work environment that were all runners and they ran not to win the race, but they ran to just for the pure enjoyment of running. And I thought, well, what, that's kind of a novel concept. And uh, so I decided to try on this, this running thing and absolutely fell in love with running and running at my own pace. And so that was kind of my entry into, uh, into fitness. And at the time I was actually registered in the kinesiology program at Simon Fraser in uh, Burna, beautiful Burnaby, BC. And I thought I was going to become a physio. That was kind of my long-term goal. But as I became more, uh, in, in love with fitness and, and started to learn more about the human body, I was like, wow, this, this could be a thing. Like I could actually spend my career helping people move their bodies. How cool would that be? And so I kind of transitioned my intentions in my kines program into health and fitness and becoming a health and fitness professional. It's a good point too, that a lot of the way we 
are introduced to fitness growing up is through a competitive lens or, or through sort of that PE lens where you, yes. um, you're comparing and you're kind of forced to do it, but. Or being yelled at for not, you know, for walking on the block run. That was one of my experiences yes. sadly growing up. And so it was, a, it was very early on. I, I developed this kind of exercise as punishment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my parents did their best trying to introduce me to different things. They exposed me to lots of different things, swimming and gymnastics and even some dance, but none of it really, I never felt like I belonged because especially because I was in a bigger body at the time, I was very much ostracized for that. Um, you know, similar to how, you know, things are shifting, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, definitely when I was growing up, I was bullied for being in, in the body I was in. And so, you know, you want me to move that body that's, you know, not, according to society standards, good enough. No, thanks. I I'll just go sit over here. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't remember there being a lot of flexibility in the way it was taught. I don't know how no. much it's changed. I grew up doing pro, uh, competitive swimming outside of school. Mm. And so when I would go to gym class, I would typically mm-hmm. be sort of goofing off and, right. and just trying to have fun in it. Yeah. It was not, it was not reciprocated. Yeah. <laughs> You'd not, okay. No, <laughs> smarten up. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think growing up, you know, I grew up in the era of the, um, oh gosh, what was those badges called the Canadian excellence standards or whatever they were, that test that we had to do every year and, oh, and the, yes. the, the chin hang, the flexed arm hang and the sit ups and the run. And I always, always, always got the participation badge, which oh. really just felt like a slap in the face. <laughs> Cause yeah. you know, you're not good enough and you genuinely don't measure up. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, not necessarily the most uh, supportive of us having a positive relationship with our bodies for sure. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And can you touch on what you're now doing professionally with fitness? Yeah, I really, I mean, I've been in the industry for 20 plus years now and as a kinesiologist and as a uh, a health professional, I really kind of have moved out of the kind of one-to-one personal training and really transitioned my focus of my, my practice of helping people to really helping people figure out what makes them inspired. So I tend to do what I would consider more health and fitness coaching now, um, as opposed to the kind of what I found was people know what they need to do (laughs) most of the time. Um, Sometimes we need to unravel some of the things, pardon me, that they think they should do. But, uh, you know, they have a sense of what it means to be healthy, to move their bodies, but where they get stuck is in the practice. Like, how do I actually transition that into something I can do? (laughs) So what I do now more than ever is coach either one-to-one or in small groups with this frame of body positivity, with this frame of your body's not broken, your body's awesome. Let's find the ways that you like to move that bring you joy. Let's find the ways that you can nourish your body that feel good in your body that isn't based on this set of rules that you need to follow or this strict program or plan that you need to adhere to in your fitness. But instead, let's find the ways to be healthy that really work for you and your life. And I I love that message. I mean, especially going into this time of year and and we're going to get into all Mm -hmm. that, but Let's touch a bit on your personal philosophy. So you yeah. you say you're anti diet. Um, you don't mm-hmm. like to talk diets. You don't like to talk weight loss. <laughs> Can you explain why and how you apply this to to your work? Yeah, and so you know this <clears throat> classification of myself as as is quite clearly anti diet is relatively new. I would say in the last like two three years, I've really become clear that you know diets don't work. (laughs) The research is quite abundant, actually, that that diets, really strict, regimented diets, eat this, not that, they just don't work long term. Mm -hmm. We don't have any long term data. And so and and the, and the data means matters to me. <laughs> I mean, also anecdotally, they don't work. I've worked yeah. with lots and lots of people over the years. And the bottom line is that, you know, trying to change our bodies, not only does it make the our in health endeavors, not that much fun. <laughs> it actually doesn't give us the outcomes we seek. You know, we don't tend to see positive health outcomes when we focus primarily on losing weight or changing the shape of our bodies. You know, and there's lots of correlations with people being in bigger bodies and having all these health consequences. But when we actually look at the research, what we see is that these are correlations, not causations. Mm. And so what we see is that the 
the increased incidence of lifestyle related diseases that we see in people amongst people in bigger bodies is actually more related to the yo-yo dieting that they're doing, which is actually a result of being stigmatized for their body and all the stress we deal with from being stigmatized. Absolutely. It's the stigma that costs us way more in our health than, than actually just being in a bigger body. You know, I, I, I adhere to this philosophy that there is meant to be body diversity on this planet of ours and that we're not all meant to conform to what happens to be right now a very narrow uh, idealized aesthetic, which is primarily thin and kind of muscular at the moment. But yeah. that's changing too. It's an ever moving target, which is the, yet another reason we need to kind of throw it out the window <laughs> as a as a philosophy. Yeah, if it felt like we were moving away from it. And then I've sort of been seeing it coming back a bit more again on social I know. media. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's been interesting, actually, with the pandemic, I've actually noticed there seems to be kind of a rebound of diet mentality. Yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what that's about. I suspect it has something to do with our desire to control something in our lives. But that's just my thought Rum, my, my my internal yeah. rumblings I don't know have any bearings for that <laughs> no I, I could absolutely see that because it is one yeah. of the few things this year that we've been able to really absolutely in a way control and then in a lot of ways not control so yeah something we're, we're aware of and then s- sort of on the opposite of this then do you believe people should be setting goals with their fitness and if so what would you tie those goals to yeah I, I think that Goals are are good. Um, They work really well for some people. But I think where we can get in trouble with goals is that we get quite black and white. So we have a bit of a binary relationship. So, you know, if I achieve this goal, I'm good. If I don't achieve this goal, I'm somehow a failure. So I think for some people, if you're too binary in your thinking, achieving goals can be risky. <laughs> but I do think we need to have an overarching vision for what we want to achieve and how we want to feel in our bodies. And so kind of, I, I tend to try to frame it into, into the realm of, you know, what would you like to be able to do with your body? How would you like to feel doing those things? Let's work you towards that as opposed to this, you know, uh, black and white goal of, I want to be able to run 5k or I want to be able to, you know, do a push up. Pardon me. You know, it's not, um, that there's anything wrong with those goals. If that works for you and that inspires you and it keeps you out getting out for your runs. Great. Mm -hmm. But for some people that's going to be potentially kind of triggering because there's this, you know, what if I don't achieve it and then what happens and how do I feel about that? Mm Mm-hmm. When I was uh, living on my own, I had made the goal just that I want to be able to carry up all my groceries. Yes. <laughs> I love that, Morgan. And I felt that's, so strong yes. when I could do it. I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. that's a, and so that's a brilliant example of, you know, again, health has kind of taken on this life of its own health and fitness where, you know, we get really you know, narrowed in on this idea of, you know, wanting to be able to do things that are kind of not related to our overall health and well-being and our livelihood at all. I think having a goal of being mm-hmm. able to carry your groceries, that's beautiful. You know, <laughs> often when I deal with, I, I, I work primarily with women, uh, but of all ages. And I have a lot of, a lot of grandmas I work with and they'll be like, I want to get, be able to get down on the floor and play with my grandkids and get back up and not feel like I can't move my body to do that. Yeah. That's a really tangible really life affirming goal. Yeah. <laughs> and so when it's things like that, I'm like all over the goals. Um, mm-hmm. But I would say they kind of I tend to frame it in the realm of kind of more of a vision as opposed to a, a detailed goal. I really like that because yeah, doing a push up doesn't necessarily yeah. change. So you my can do a push up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing that ever. <laughs> but I mean, here's the thing. If you can do push ups, that yep. that strength is going to transfer into maybe being able to kind of I don't know, lift a kayak up over your head so you can get your kayak on your car, Uh, you know, things like that. So there's, you know, there's, it's not saying that we shouldn't do those things, but let's make sure they have relevance to the things we want to be able to do that would actually impact our lives. Absolutely. Okay. Um, So our next topic is talking about fitness and work performance. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see a correlation? Do you believe there's correlation? Um, Yeah. What are your thoughts there? 
Absolutely. You know, I think one of the things, uh, you know, of course, we can come back to that kind of a, that example of, I want to be able to do the push up so I can lift the kayak up over my, my roof, you know, when we're, especially if we're in an office job, I mean, if we're in a physical job, there's obvious correlations. But if you're sitting at an, a desk job, there's actually a huge value to making sure that you're moving your body enough so that we actually can be able to focus and perform, you know, and then, you know, the other pieces in terms of relevance to performance is, you know, we, we actually know that our brains need rest to perform and be innovative and creative. And it's, you know, the example I often say is, you know, you've been thinking about a project all day at work, and you're trying to come up with this creative idea or this new marketing campaign or whatever it is that you're doing. And you're kind of stuck in it, you can't really think of it. So you leave work for the day, and you're driving home, and you're driving home doing something different with your body. And your mind is just kind of wandering. And lo and behold, the idea comes to you. And Mm -hmm. fitness is one of the ways we can do that. So it's that taking that 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute break in the middle of your day, going for a walk gives your brain the opportunity to actually process and come up with innovative ideas so that we can actually perform better. We also know that taking breaks is really, really helpful to having good performance. You know, our brains just simply don't focus for a seated eight hours in a stint. That's not how our brains work. We Mm -hmm. need those breaks. And so if we want to think about, you know, performing well at work, fitness is a great tool in the toolkit, for sure. I often find along lines of what you've just been saying, ideas come to me usually mm-hmm. after my brain's felt more inactive for a while. Yes. And then suddenly maybe I'm, I'm relaxed and I'm like, Oh, there's yeah. the the solution to how I can do that. Totally. Uh, yeah. Definitely yeah. something I think we're aware of, but it can be very underrated. Yeah. Absolutely. Lots of hustle culture. <laughs> right. Well, and, and this is the thing, I mean, this is the cost of kind of our hustle grit kind of culture is that we don't ever give ourselves time to, you know, slow down and do some quieter activities, you know, uh, you know, one of the big pieces I talk about in when I'm coaching clients, it's, it's not just about your physical body, let's talk about the bigger, broader, more holistic view of health, where it's the the health of your physical body, as well as the health of your mind and the health of your spirit. And so not all of what we need to do to be healthy is, you know, get out there and do the hard workout. But it's also, you know, can I take this time to slow my brain down and do some practices of self care, maybe some journaling, maybe some gratitude, maybe some meditation, what are some of the spiritual pieces of the puzzle that really help me feel uh, engaged with my life and feel like my bucket is full. Uh, That all contributes to our performance as well. If we feel happy and fulfilled Mm -hmm. in our lives, we're going to be more effective at work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So with this year, I mean, it's been difficult on, Mm -hmm. on so many levels for people. Do you see some collective struggles? I think you touched a little bit on sort of a refocus on on kind of the look of our body, but are there some common struggles you've seen that we're facing with this year to mm-hmm. keep up with um, fitness and just our general health? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one of the things I keep reminding my clients of is, oh, have you have you been through a pandemic before? Oh, right. No, no, you haven't. You're in a completely new realm. We are in a time that is completely unprecedented for us. We have not experienced this and it's very stressful. And so, you know, we need to acknowledge that the routines that we had before pre-pandemic are not necessarily going to be the same routines. I hear a lot of people being really hard on themselves because I haven't been able to keep up with the gym or my gym's now closed and I can't go there or the gym I wanted to go to, you know, they closed, they didn't make it um, or the things I've always done, they just don't inspire me right now or I just don't have the energy. And so I'm talking a lot with a lot of people about giving yourself permission to do different. It's okay you have not been through a pandemic before. This is a completely big, giant game changer, right? So we are in a completely different set of circumstances now. And we can't just try to insert our old lifestyle into these new circumstances, it might just not jive. And that's okay. And actually, that might be great. I've had a lot of clients that are like, you know, if it weren't for the pandemic, I totally wouldn't have started exercising at home. And now I love exercising at home. It's so much more convenient for me. And I really love it. Great. 
And so you might actually find that if you give yourself permission to not, you know, try to keep hammering doing the things that aren't working, you know, which just tends to be what we try to do. I'll just, you know, keep trying to do the same plan over and over and over again. But I keep not doing it. <laughs> so but and making it mean that I'm somehow a failure. No, it's just that that's not the plan for you. And maybe just not the plan for you right now. And that's okay. Can we mm-hmm. find a different way of approaching this that still serves you as an individual? Mm-hmm. So I um, think that yeah. kind of doing trying to do the same thing that you used to do is one of the big struggles that I keep seeing, um, and not giving yourself permission to change. Um, I would say the other big struggle that I hear people doing is this very all or none. I'm either all in or I'm all out. And I always call that it's it's the wagon talk. (laughs) And the wagon talk is hefty when we get to this time of the year. A lot of people will say like, "Ah, I'm off the wagon, but I'll just start fresh in January. And I always tell people like, don't start fresh in January. Every moment is a clean slate. Can you find some strategies that you can do right now Maybe they're not the full, most robust version of what you'd like to be doing. That's okay. Can you find some sort of new ground here that feels like you're still moving forward or maybe you're holding status quo and you feel pretty good about it as opposed to feeling kind of crappy? Because we all know what happens when we say we throw in the towel and we say, I'll just start fresh in, you know, on Monday or next mm-hmm. month or next in next year is that the next duration of time, whatever that ends up being, and sometimes it's upwards of a month, well, just everything goes, it goes, you know, out the window, and we do all the things, and not necessarily in the best way for our health. So can we lean in with doing what we can do and focus on what we can do, not not on all the things we aren't doing? So that was kind of a double header, the, you know, the all or none thinking. And then, you know, if we can shift that into really focusing on what we can do, as opposed to focusing with our good old negativity bias on the Mm -hmm. things we're not doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I like your comment about allowing ourselves to accept the change and doing something different because I mean, this might, this might be me projecting, but (laughs) I've felt this sense lately that there's an expectation that Mm. we're acting normal again, yes. quote unquote. And I've been seeing articles saying how, oh, yep, we're, we're kind of getting back to normal and mm. workforces are going back to normal. And I'm like, it's, Mm-mm. it's not the case, but no. And yeah, like you said, things are still closed. We still have a complete different, everything's different. So yeah. giving that permission to be like, okay, it's not the way it used to be. Yeah. What can I do now? Yeah. And like, and actually viewing that as Uh, you know, that might be a stretch for some people, depending on your circumstances, but viewing it as an opportunity, like, oh, Mm -hmm. I get to explore in a different way. This could actually be kind of cool if I actually give myself permission to explore without judgment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you touched on that we're we're having a lot of stress. Mm. Um, (laughs) What, what impact does this stress have on our bodies? Oh, I mean, it's huge. Um, I'm actually just reading a book called Burnout by Emily and Amelia Nagoski uh, that I, I'm only partway through it, but I'm already, you know, I'm already recommending it to everybody I know. It's definitely catered to women, um, but you know, I'm sure that any man would get benefit from it. But they talk a lot about stress and the cost of stress. You know, what we know about stress is that chronic stress is absolutely detrimental to our overall health and absolutely, you know, much bigger of a deal to our overall health and well-being than say whether we're exercising regularly or whether we're, you know, eating a nutritionally balanced diet. Mm -hmm. Um, Stress is huge. It's kind of the big one that we just don't talk about. And we, as a culture, we actually kind of put stress up on this weird pedestal. We have this weird, we have this weird relationship with stress. It's like we're, you know, we idealize busy and push and grit and grind, but then we also like, Oh, take time for you. (laughs) And (laughs) just make it productive. (laughs) Have a, have a a bubble bath, you know, that self care stuff. And, and what I like about the way that uh, they frame it in Burnout is they talk about the stress cycle. They actually get into the science of it, which be still my geeky heart. Um, <laughs> they talk about the stress cycle and they talk about how stress has a beginning, a middle and an end. And what happens in chronic, chronic states of stress is we don't resolve our stress very well. Once the stressor has been, re- once we're, the stressor is gone, um, 
that doesn't mean stress in, in our bodies is gone. <laughs> so, you know, we work hard. So for example, we work hard to get to a deadline. We push, push, push to get to that end of that deadline. And then the deadline's met, but we still have the internal rumblings of stress happening in our bodies. The deadline's done, check, mark the box, but we still have a stress response happening in our body and we need a way to resolve that stress. And what I love about the book is that they talk about the very best way to help us resolve the stress cycle is moving our bodies. <laughs> so, uh-huh. you know, and I think we anecdotally know this, uh, most of us that, you know, if they're really, st- we have, we're dealing with a peak stress st- situation, a lot of people will say like, I like to go for a run, or I like to, you know, dance it out in my living room, or go for a walk with a friend. Those are all ways to help complete the stress cycle and tell our bodies and our minds we're okay, that we're done the stress cycle. So yeah, stress has a huge impact on our health and, 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 and our overall well-being and, and fitness can be a part of the solution. We keep changing what's happening this year. So yeah. I like your comments yes. about, you know, giving yourself a little bit of grace because the stress, if you keep trying to stick mm-hmm. to something so regimented right now, yeah. I think you're going to have a lot of, a lot of quote unquote disappointments or, or you'll Absolutely. just see yourself as failing and. It's not the well, case. And we, you know, if we look at kind of the internal dialogue that starts to happen when we perceive something as a failure, for most people, that inner dialogue, that self-critic will start to fire on up like, ugh, you know, that internal dialogue that you hear that inner bully sometimes that kind of pops up when you feel like you're not meeting, you're not setting the standard that you're not meeting your goals. And so what we know about self-criticism is that it's counterproductive to actually being successful. So it, uh, it is inversely correlated with self-efficacy, which is our belief in our capability of being successful. And so, you know, we have this internal dialogue and we actually have also an, when st- self-criticism rises, we also have an internal stress response that is happening, triggered by the fact that we're attacking ourselves. <laughs> so there's a lot of s- stress that's related to this, you know, the, how we are responding to our and how we're relating to what we're doing or not doing. So again, that's where that permission and grace and I talk a lot about self-compassion, like how can we how can we be kind to ourselves? And, you know, the other side of self-compassion, this yang side of self-compassion, how can we also uh, be an inner coach for ourselves? It's like, okay, you got this, you can do this, like, you're capable of this, or, you know, oh, this is happening, you're having a hard moment, hand on heart, this is difficult, but you're going to get through this. You know, how mm-hmm. can we meet ourselves with grace? Yeah. And, and part mm-hmm. of why we wanted to do this episode now was, mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of people might see fitness or that in the introduction and go, oh no, that's the last thing I want to think about right now. <laughs> yes. I'm going into the holidays. This is where I'm going to, everything's going to fall apart for me. I'm completely mm-hmm. backpedaling my work. How do you suggest we reframe this thinking? Yeah. Because like you said, it can be quite harmful to say, oh, next month I'll, I'll do this. Right now I'm off the wagon, quote unquote. Right. That how wagon. would you yeah how would you reframe <laughs> that yeah one of the strategies I use with my clients uh around this kind of all or nine thing all or none thinking is is something I call the health zone you know it's a topic it's a, a, a frame that I developed in my in my book and I talk about instead of having these black and white ideas of what it is we think we should be doing and I would say don't should yourself because should tends to be led from shame you know what instead of kind of thinking in terms of black and white, what's the range of behaviors that you could set up for yourself, where at the very bottom of the range, you have these non negotiable habits. And when I say non negotiable, I mean, like they can happen no matter what's going down. I'm talking things like brushing your teeth, drinking a certain amount of water, but like, not gallons, we're not talking about meeting your quote unquote quota. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, what are the base level things going for a 10 minute walk, taking a five minute movement break at in the middle of your workday, you know, really simplistic things, really simplistic health and, and wellness and behaviors that you can make happen, even when I say the poop is hitting the fan. And then on the other end of your health zone, you've got the behaviors and routines and habits that you would like that would maybe stretch you a little bit that would maybe challenge you. And I often say, like, as we're heading into say, a uh, you know, a holiday season, whether that's the winter holidays, whether that's summer holidays, or if maybe you're heading on vacation, that's a little bit different right now. But you know, in theory, thinking kind of more globally mm-hmm. about the idea you know, can you redefine your health zone for that period you're entering? So as we're heading into the holidays, can you think of this next phase or next month, whatever it is for you, 
and think about what are some non-negotiable health habits you could maintain no matter what. And know that if you fall anywhere between that lower limit of the health zone, that non-negotiable and the upper limit, that upper end that's stretching you, you are being successful so that you aren't thinking in this black and white frame, but you actually are giving yourself more room to be successful. Mm -hmm. And overall, it sounds like that would help reduce the stress. Yes. And that, like you were saying, is one of the most important things. Yeah. 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 We don't need to start the new year upset at ourselves. That's the last thing we need. Well, and, and so this is the thing. We, we tend to get all hopeful as we head into the new year. And, and hope's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful feeling. It gives us all sorts of energy. But it's, you know, when we feel like we're starting 10 steps back from where we could be, there's this kind of preemptive def- deflating <laughs> that we have. And instead, can we if we lean into the things we can do through the holiday season, you know, think about where you'll be starting in January. Mm -hmm. If you start to kind of then, you know, readdress your health zone again in January and be like, okay, now I'm into the new month, the new year. What, what could this health zone look like shifted forward? Mm -hmm. And you'd mentioned your book there. I just wanted to see if you could, could just give us the title. Yeah, of course. Um, It's called the elephant in the gym. Uh, And the subtitle is your, your body positive guide to writing your own health and fitness story. I like that. I'll make sure that that's in the podcast description for anyone as well. So for folks who hate going to the gym (laughs) or hate having, you know, that sort of traditional exercise model, you have to go and do uh, this much time on the the treadmill and then go Mm -hmm. do these weights and, Mm. and so on. What are your suggestions for finding enjoyable ways to work out? Yeah, I think the first thing I always love clearing up is that there's no, there's no health requirement to do formal exercise. Mm-hmm. And I was, people are like, pardon me, what, what was that? <laughs> um, uh, you know, the joke I always like to say is like, you don't have to hit the gym or do hit to be healthy. You do need to move your body. So here's the distinction I love to make. In Canada, the guidelines are that over the course of the week, we are, we, we see a, a positive effect when we, we see a cumulative amount of about 150 minutes per week over the course of the week. So what does that mean? 150 minutes, and it can be chunked out in as small a chunks as you want. (laughs) Five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 20 minutes here, 30 minutes here. And it's really just getting your body into a movement pattern that moves your heart rate up and your breathing rate up. Something that would be classified as moderate to vigorous, but you don't have to do vigorous, but moderate uh, physical activity. So that might be dancing in your living room. That might be going for a walk around the block. That might be gardening. That might be cleaning. Yes, you can get chores done, move your body, and check a box of getting some physical. Cleaning is tough. Cleaning is sweaty (laughs) work. I always joke. I try to like try to squeeze the little cleaning in here and there, and then I'm all sweaty, and I'm like, why am I? Why do I do that to myself? Um, (laughs) You know, I think you know. Definitely, we love to see if we can incorporate a couple of times a week. The guidelines for Canadians actually were just updated in the last uh, few months. And so um, in the really, if you want to kind of check them out, you can go to CSEP, uh, their website, or on participation, they have them available there. But the, the new guidelines are for 24-hour periods, looking at what adults should be doing in terms of movement. And, you know, really the focus is on reduction of sedentary behavior. So just moving your body up more standing up, getting your body moving on a regular basis, you know, making sure you're getting enough sleep is one of the guidelines, monitoring screen time, again, so that we're moving Mm -hmm. our bodies more just generally speaking. And then that 150 minutes done over the course of the week with if we can integrating two strength building, um, in t- some two activities per week that really challenge the strength and endurance of our bodies. So, you know, mm-hmm. but that's like, if you are cleaning and you're squatting down to do something, that's a strength exercise. And so sometimes oh, we yeah. get stuck on, I have to go lift weights to get strength activities. Not true at all. If you like Pilates or yoga, those are both great strength builders. You know, if you like to, dance or do some sort of class also great if you just want to move your body in space in your home also great you don't have to do quote-unquote formal exercise to be healthy I like that clarification Mm -hmm. on strength because a thing I hear often is people not wanting to lift weights because they don't want to get bulky or Uh, oh gosh and you know 
Morgan, that's one of my like biggest pet peeves is people are so scared of weights. I mean, it's one thing if you're avoiding them because you just don't love them. Like, absolutely. If you don't enjoy lifting weights, I would say like, there's lots of different ways to lift weights that can be, you know, different and shake it up. And I think it has everything to do with how you're taught to do it. And if you really don't enjoy it, that's one thing. But if you're not doing it because you're scared of what, how it's going to change your body, I always just invite people to like, who says our bodies aren't allowed to have muscle mass? Where is this coming from? And why is it that we all feel that we need to conform to this very narrow Mm -hmm. aesthetic? Again, can we get back to form and function? Like, what do I want to be able to do with my body? And I don't know about you, but like when I'm 80 to 90, I want to be able to, you know, be living independently. I want to be able to you know, pick up my grandkids and give them a hug and swing them around. I, I'd loved my vision is that, you know, when I'm 80, I want to be running 5Ks with my grandkids and doing, you know, super fun, active things, getting out in nature. So in order for me to do that, I know that right now I need to do some, you know, moving our bodies through space and doing the strength building is going to, especially for, for women, but for everybody, uh, it's going to help strengthen our bones. It strengthens, gives us our muscle mass. We need to maintain our muscle mass because as we are aging naturally, there is a loss in muscle mass. There's an, uh, um, an atrophy that happens just naturally without us doing anything. So we need to counteract that by doing some strength building activities. Absolutely. And then yeah. for the people who are typically on the more vigorous side of exercise, yeah. they love going to the gym, but those awesome. things have been cut off for them this year, mm. closed. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would you suggest for, for those people? Maybe yeah. they're feeling some frustration and yeah, yeah totally. Um, what if this was an opportunity? <laughs> That's, I, I would say, it, it, take it as an opportunity to reframe. What if this is an opportunity to try something new, uh, to discover a sport or something that you completely never even knew you loved or come back to a sport? You know, I actually went through, uh, I'm doing some work with a, a pelvic floor physio right now because of some pelvic floor dysfunction. And uh, she, she said to me, she's like, you know, I'd really like you to back off your running. At the time I was training for a half marathon. I was like, what? I felt like the rug had been taken out from under me because a lot of what I do is actually teach people how to run Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, virtually right now, but not in person in general uh, or in person in in general. And so, you know, for me to be told uh, you can't run was like a bit of a a bit of a sideswipe I was not expecting. And so, you know, what's cool about it, though, has been that I rediscovered my love of road riding and getting on my mountain bike and hiking. I hiked more this uh, this past summer than and this fall than I have in years and it brought me so much joy. And so sometimes we get forced into these changes and we may not love it, but the resistance to that change isn't going to make the change any easier. It's just going to make it harder. So instead of like resisting the change and being kind of upset about that we can't do the things we always wanted to do, can we reframe it and look at it as an opportunity to try something new? And with you saying, you know, what the guidelines are for our health numbers or the amount yeah. of, of activity there, mm-hmm. I wonder if maybe it's worthwhile to to think about why sometimes we feel like we need to be so intense yeah. sometimes. Yes. Oh, I love that you said that, Morgan. I think it's really important to look at that. Like, what is in it for you? Like, some people love that feeling in their body of vigorous, hard effort. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I love a good sweat fest. (laughs) Um, You know, I love spinning. I love hard hits. It's just, it makes me happy. You know, whether, call it the endorphins, call it the, uh, call it the, you know, the runner's high or the experience of the exercise high that we get from some of these exercises. Uh, But, you know, when you're so regimented and so stuck in the way that you have to do things, I always think it's like an opportunity to look at why are you so stuck in that? And can you find your way to, you know, the other side of that and give yourself a bit more grace? Could you shake things up? What, you know, I always think it's important to look at what's driving the behavior, what's driving us to do the things. Mm -hmm. And if, what's behind that is a desire to change our bodies, uh, which is the case for a lot of people who are really deeply invested in doing things in a certain way in a very regimented manner, then I, I always invite people to think, well, what's, what's driving that? Who says your body needs to be a certain way? And can you, you know, find more freedom and more positivity with your body and more acceptance of your body as is, and recognize that your body's actually awesome. 
the way it is Super <laughs> without awesome. any changes required. <laughs> Super awesome. Yes. I like that. That's a fantastic yeah. note to kind of end my group of questions here on, but I wanted to see if there was something else, uh, anything you wanted to touch on, anything we've missed. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as your head, head um, the biggest thing I hope that, that uh, listeners are getting from this is that as we're heading into this holiday season, just, you know, generous helping of grace and space for yourself. Um, a lot of self-compassion as, you know, the hiccups of the season will come. This is going to be a different holiday season than we've had in the past, you know, and so give yourself a lot of kindness and extend that kindness to others, you know, lean into offering yourself a more holistic approach to your health that includes not just how do we maintain our physical health, but how do we also, you know, maintain our mental and spiritual health? And how can you take care of those pieces over this next period of time? That's fantastic. And I'm going to be linking all your information below. But before we close, though, could you just share where people can find you online, yeah, sure. um, how people can reach out to you? Fantastic. They can check out my website at uh, superu.ca. That's my main website that has all of the different things I do. I also have an online studio, which is where people can exercise with me. They can be part of my online studio crew. That's superustudio.com just to be confusing, a one's a dot com, one's a dot ca. Um, and uh, you can find me on all of the socials uh, on Facebook. I'm super you fit. And on Instagram, I'm just Jillian Gertzen, all one word. Thank you so much, Jillian. I think this is a fantastic mindset to put ourselves into this time of year. And I hope for everyone listening that this has been helpful. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Small Business Mastermind and an extra special thank you to Jillian for sharing so much wonderful advice with us. A reminder that her book and details will all be linked in the podcast description. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving it a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, following on Spotify, or visiting olympiabenefits.com slash podcast to join our special notifications list. We have one more episode coming before the end of 2020. I personally cannot believe this year is almost over. So stay tuned for that. And I'll be talking to you again very soon. Mm -hmm.